I am not a guest speaker. I'm part of this church. <laughs> so don't do that to me, embarrassing me. I'm already nervous as it is, okay? Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity, Pastor, to, it's real uh, privilege to be able to share the good news to everyone. Uh, but before I start, what I really want to talk about today, I want to recognize what has happened in this country. I am not sure if you heard about it or not, but this last Valentine's Day in the Majority Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, there is another school shooting. One student that was expelled the year before came back and started killing other children, other students. Uh, 17 people, as a result, 17 people were killed. Majority of them are between 14 to 18, mainly 14, and several of the uh, teachers and coaches. You know, I cannot imagine how a parent would feel. You take your children to school in the morning, but you can never pick them up again because they die. I don't think any children should go to school and not return. And I don't think any parents or any adult, instructors, teacher, coaches should go to school and never return. So I want us to, you know, remember this family in prayer and remember this young generation. We pray that God can give them comfort, give them strength. When this kind of thing happens, it is really difficult to understand. We think God is good, is faithful, endures. But I, it is very difficult for parents at this moment, at that high, high school, when your children is being shot and killed. As a believer, we know that what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it to something good. But it still does not negate the hurt, what they experience. I believe that God never got off, got off guard because he sees the beginning and he also sees the end. Sometimes we wonder what this society has come to, but I hope at the end of the service we all know and can make a decision what God, the assignment that God put in our heart, what we need to do because God has purpose in each one of us. The fact that we are still alive today, we are not done. You know, I immediately hear all the politicians jumping from both sides, jumping into the discussion, promoting their own agenda, more, maybe more laws, maybe less gun, maybe more gun. You know, but I'm not here to discuss any of the politics or law. We know that all these new laws and politics, it doesn't seem, I'm not sure if that's effective because the fact of the matter is we keep hearing this more and more. It seems like the violence increasing all the time regardless of what the politician is doing. But one thing I know for sure that this society need the good news of Jesus Christ. They need to hear since I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know the history since early 60s, uh, they decided that in the name of separation of church and state, they remove all the prayer from school. When they do that, they remove God from the school. They remove the protection of God from school. They don't teach anymore right and wrong. Everything is relative. No wonder we, wo we wonder why all the young generation 
they grow up and does not know right and wrong. They do not have any standard of what's right and wrong. Instead, everything becomes relative. If it's good for you, it's good for you. They don't have anything that can anchor their moral into a standard. They lost their moral compass because we remove God. So what we need is God. Now, let me tell you, it's not all gloom and doom. You know, when Elijah pray after he win the tournament with the bill, he said, God, there's only one me. And God said, no. you know what God said? No. There is still a remnant of people that never bow down their feet for bail. I want to take this opportunity now to pray a little bit for these people and for our young generation. I want to invite uh, Shannon and uh, Rachel to come forward. You know, as a church, we are very proud that there is still a young generation. There is people that will never bow down to this, to the bail of this country. Come on, come on up, guys. And they were still willing to stand in the gap and pray for, pray for this country. So I want to invite all of us to stand up and let's pray together. Let's pray together. This country needs God. This country needs Jesus. Our society needs Jesus. Our community needs Jesus. Our family needs Jesus. Each of one of us needs Jesus. Let's pray. Just pray, guys. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God, uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, God, I thank you that um, even through all this um, chaos and messiness, that you're still sovereign, that you still, um, you still create Amen. this world, that you still, um, you still rule this world. Uh, I just pray for all the violence. I just pray for it to stop, Jesus. I just pray that... Um, that the violence in these people's hearts, that it would just turn to love, that it would just turn to your love, and that we wouldn't spread violence, we wouldn't spread hate, but that we'd spread your love and your good news. Amen. That the thing that would be magnified most in this society would be you. Yes. The thing talked about in the news would be you, and just revivals, not shootings, not massacres, not bombings, but it would just be you. Amen. That you'd be magnified in this society, Jesus, that it wouldn't be hurt or hatred. I pray that you would just... um raise up Christian leaders in this generation, that you would give people the bravery, the courage just to speak about you, to talk about you, to um, love other people boldly, to show people the love that you've given us, that you would just shine through all of us, Jesus, and that it'd be, um, it'd be a genuine love, that it wouldn't be a, um, a fake love, Jesus. I thank you so much just for everything that you do for us, just how much you love us, how much you care for us, how much you care for this nation and for your people. Um, you are so good, and you've never stopped being good, and you never will. Um, we love you so much, and we pray. Um, Jesus, uh, we just, whatever happened this past week was super unexpected. No one knew it was ha uh, gonna happen, uh, but I just wanna pray right now over the families who have to deal with something like this. They didn't know, like what Pastor Jonathan said earlier, that imagine going to school on an ordinary day and, and just you're not able to go home. And imagine those parents who, who are just waiting for their children and they, they, they find out that they can't pick up their, their, their kids. We just want to pray over those families right now, whatever emptiness that they have, that they, would, they wouldn't fill it up with the wrong things, but that they would fill it up with you. They would fill it up with your love, and that you just give them peace and joy in, in their lives, and that they would just receive you. And wherever they're running to, that if it's, if it's not a part of your plan, that they would run away from it, that they would run to you instead, that they would come and find you. They would, they would just receive you and just... Understand that through all of this, it's a part of your plan, and that they won't, they won't um, be angry at you. You just give them peace, uh, and yeah, you just bless on every single one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. 
you know, the media is continuously covering this and presented with a lot of different opinions. You know, this tra tragedy is really, really horrific. But I want to also bring to your attention other tragedy that are horrific, but the media seldom mention about it. Let me give you an example. Infant mortality rate. Do you know what infant mortality rate is? Infant mortality rate is the number of the baby that died in 1,000 births. If there is 1,000 births of babies, how many babies actually does not make it one year up to the, birth, the first year birthday in a certain area? That's called infant mortality rate. CDC and the United Nations gather a statistic of the number of the infant mortality rate. The worst one, which is the highest, the highest is the worst. Okay, the highest one is Afghanistan with the number of 112.8. So it means there is every 1,000 child being born, 112 kids did not make it to age one. And then followed by another African country, United States, America, is number 170. So actually, the lower we are on the rank, the better it is, obviously. The rate is 5.8. So it means less than six people died in one year. Less than six babies die in one year out of 1,000 people, babies being born. Got that one? Okay, it's still an unfortunate that there is six baby that died, but if you look at it, the history in the last 100 years, the number has declined 95%. In the early 1900s, was over 100. Because of the good technology and everything, now it drops to only 5.8. But one thing that we seldom hear is the intentional ending of life before they even get a chance to be born. In other words, that's an abortion. The society would like to think, hey, since they are not human beings, it's okay to be killed. Obviously, that is not true. That's a discussion for another day. But I would, what I would like to bring to your attention today is the skill of the number of victims out of this tragedy. The CDC, which is Center for Disease Control, the one that actually manages uh, any disease or anything that causes people to die, they have a statistic from 1973. The reason 1973 is 1973 is when abortion becomes legal. Up to 2017, the total for 44 years Somebody is still calculating 73, 2017. That's 44 years. Anybody care to guess the number? 54 million? Anybody else want to guess? Very close. The actual number is 60,069,971. They keep track because this is the legal one. The illegal one, we don't know. Okay. This is out of 1,720 clinics in the United States. So on the average, if they perform only 2.7 abortion per clinic, it reaches this number every day. Okay. So if you calculated 60 million divided by the 44 years, on the average would be 1,365,227 abortion annually per day and um, per year. Now divide that by 365, we got the number per day. Per day is 3,740 babies being killed per day. If you compare this thing to a school shooting with only comes 180 days per year, they don't come every day because we can, we don't go to school, the number would jump into 7,585. 
Can you imagine hearing 700, over 7,500 people die every single work day? We would not be able to imagine how would that be. This total number exceeded every war that United States throughout the whole history exceeded all the world war and civil war. The shooting is really horrific tragedy, but it pales in comparison to the intentional killing that we as a country have done. You know, we're not talking about abortion today, so don't worry. Uh, I just want to make us aware how far we have gone away from what is right. Just because it feels comfortable, everything seems to be okay, we as a nation ignore certain things. Actually, that was in the Bible. Apostle Paul mentioned that in Romans 11, 9. David spoke to the same thing when he said, let their bountiful table become a snare, a trap that makes them think that all is well, and let their blessing cause them to stumble. We need to, as a, as a believer, we need to really be careful of what the blessing that has God has given us and forgetting about all the tragedy that happens. The bottom line is, we need Jesus. You know, this country needs Jesus. We all need Jesus. This society needs Jesus. This community needs Jesus. We all need Jesus. Apostle Paul asked a very good question, actually, in Romans 10, 14. Romans 10, 14. How can they call him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will everyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture meant when they say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. With that, it brings to what I really want to share today. I want to share what is, what is my or yours next yes. That would be my title for today. What is our next yes the reason i'm saying it's a next yes because we say yes to a lot of things you know well we have next thing but what would be the next thing that we are going to say yes to let me tell you when we say yes life being changed life is changed we say yes to forty-five thousand. when we say yes to light on miracle hill forty-five thousand people hear the gospel now, it's not just their life being changed, but I think our life being changed. The way we see the Word of God is different. The way we minister is different. The way we, our next step of the next years would be different because our experience in the past. That's how we build our faith. You know, there are many areas that we can say yes to. I'm nervous, that's why I'm, my mouth is dry. You know, when our, this year, our theme is multi, multiply. If you're saying just one yes, we're probably going to do the addition. If we want to say multiplication, we got to say yes and yes and keep saying yes for bigger and bigger thing. Because when you say yes, you're going to say yes to bigger thing. Just like the parable of the talent. You know what Jesus said? If you faithful for the little thing, God is going to give us big thing. If we faithful for saying yes with 45,000 people, we probably is going to see a lot more than that. You know? So there are many areas that we can say yes to. Some of us may need to say yes to God's love. Some of us may, see, may need to say yes in receiving Him. Some of us may need to say yes to turn ourselves 180 degrees and repent. Some of us need to say yes in growing our faith. Some of us need to say yes in 
joining a body of Christ and ministering. Some of us need to say yes to be disciple, and some of us need to say yes to disciple. We need both of them, but all of them required for us to say yes. There's a lot of yeses that we probably should not say yes to. You know, there is not enough time in, the, in our lifetime to say yes to everything. And there are some yeses that are not very beneficial. So don't say yes to any of those things. You know, don't say yes to too many parties on weekend because then you can't go to church. Uh, but they, they, talking about this, what I'm talking about today is saying yes to what the invitation that God has given in our life. Not just individual, but us as a corporate church. What are we going to say yes next? I want to leave the, by the end of this, I want us to think about what would be your next yes. What is God going to tell me to say yes to? When we say yes, life is changed because most of us did say yes to Light on Miracle Hill and it's pretty crazy. You know, our responsibility is to sow the seed. Our responsibility is, is just to, 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 you know, it may not grow today. It may not grow tomorrow. It may not grow next year. It may not grow even a decade from today. But let me tell you something. Yes, some of the may are the seed that we sow may, sow may fall on the hard ground. Some of them may fall on a thorn bush. But let me tell you, some of them will fall on a fertile ground. And we will never know that. We will probably never know who which fertile ground that is until we got to heaven and somebody would tell you and say, hey, I am here because when I was little, I want to see a light show and I hear the word of God. And because of that, I am now make it to heaven because of that. You will never know that. You will never be able to see that thing. But if we did not say yes last year, that would never happen in the future. So it is very important for us to say yes Making it grow is not our job, that's God's job. So, what else other thing that we want to say yes to? Sometimes we think the Americans have a term of have your ducks in a row before you do something. You know, if you saw on the YouTube, the duck will walk in a row when they walk, but they will not stand in a row. So our duck will never stand in a row. Our crazy duck would probably not going to do that. But unless we start moving, then the duck would follow each other. So that is an interesting, interesting fact that we need to start moving before our duck in a row, not the duck in a row source band, then we move. Okay? Uh, you know, uh, we, we're going to see a couple of examples in the Bible that... Uh, other pastors told Pastor Paul that we are crazy. And yes, we are crazy. You know, and uh, the reason that we're being called crazy is because we are doing something that defies common human wisdom. Most people can't see beyond physical eyes. That's what faith is. In Hebrew 11, faith says what? Faith is the confidence assurance what we hope for going to happen. It is the evidence of the thing we cannot See, so faith has something to do with efficient, with something that you physically can see. The second part here indicating vision, you know, see evidence, you can see it. Now, how do we know that the evidence is there if we can't see it? Helen Keller, one, you know, Helen Keller, she's, she's blind. Somebody asked her, uh, is there anything worse than being physically blind? Her answer is being able to see but have no vision. And the Bible mentioned about that. Without vision, my people perish or my people cast restraint. Cast restraint means you don't care, you just do whatever you want. Vision is the ability to focus on God's plan for the world. Have it grow in our heart, have it grow in our mind, but anticipating that His power is working through in order to accomplish that plan. Vision is extremely powerful. You know, in every great person, there's great vision behind it. Throughout the scripture, we know that when God's, when we say yes, God will show us a new vision. When we say yes, he will invite us to be a part of something that bigger than ourselves. He will invite, 
invite us to see something that goes beyond our timeline. He will show us evidence our physical eyes cannot see. It may not be easy because yes, include, yes, require that we put the very best for of ourselves. When we say yes, he will include to say a part or something that will outlive us. You know, when we say yes, it was going to go to beyond, beyond, the, beyond our individual, beyond all of our individual ex- uh, uh, existence. When we say yes to God, He will call us to something that goes beyond safety, that will go beyond common sense, that will go beyond our ability to even comprehend. He will include something bigger than ourselves, such that if supernaturally he does not interfere, we will not be able to make it. That is the area where God calls us. At the end of the day, it's all about him. It's not about us. With this theme of multiplication, most of, will, most of us probably refer to, we mentioned it multiple times with the feeding of 5,000. That's a classic example of the multiplication. But I want to look at from a slightly different angle uh, happen when somebody say yes, actually. When Jesus saw the, saw the crowd to him, he asked Philip, Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all these people to eat? Well, he asked Philip, when, remember, when God asks you a question, he does not look for information. Okay, he's checking on you. Okay, so don't give me the, the, the answer that you think might be right. Okay, so he's checking on you. He, if he, needs you, he already knows the future and the past, so it really does not matter. So the Bible says this is only, the Bible actually mentioned this only to test Philip, but Philip did not exactly say yes. If you notice, Philip was a little bit confused and did exactly say yes, because the real reason Jesus asked him, if Jesus wants to show Philip something, Jesus wants to show the little boy that bring the five loaves of bread and two fishes, uh, showing something, a vision. You know, they want to show the disciple a new vision. They want to show the crowd a new vision. They want to show them who he is. That's the reason he asked the question. Uh, we come to understand who Christ is. When we begin to understand what happened, when we say, yes, the vision he has come for us. Okay, uh, sometimes we don't want to say yes because we don't know. Who God is. Sometimes we're not sure if we should say yes. Sometimes we don't trust Him enough to say yes. In the book of John, this miracle, God used this as a window to see who God is. He wants to see who Jesus is. Unfortunately, at that time, Philip can't see it clearly. He asked, he, Philip's answer is, uh, eight months of wages would not be enough to buy bread for each one to have a bite. So it's not even one loaf per person, it's just a bite per person. It's not enough with eight months worth of wages. What we learn from this is God constantly initiating an invitation for us to say yes. Did you know this? Every day God invites us to join something, to be a part of something that bigger than ourselves. The issue is sometimes we are not trained ourselves to hear the word of God. We're not trained to perceive his voice. We're not trained our visual, our spiritual eyes to see the vision of something that bigger than us. We always measure, I can do this, so this is how much God can do. That's our measurement stop, stop in there. We need to trust him and we need to learn to see something that the evidence that we cannot see. But in order for us, when we say yes, let me tell you something. When we say yes, he invites us to catch a vision that includes something that's bigger than us, that's bigger than individual us. That requires for us to move in to breathe, to live, and to exist in the new realm of God. I want to call that a God space. So you enter, when you say yes, 
you enter into this God space. This God space, what is this God space? This is where the need are greater than the resource. For us to run the capital campaign, even if all of us give fully what we pledge, we still not have enough. We are not doing capital campaign with our own strength. We are entering into God's space. When the needs are greater than the resource, when the opportunity is greater than our ability, this opportunity is way bigger than what we can do. It is a scary place, let me tell you. It's not something that you walk and whistle in. It's, 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 it's dangerous. But when, when people, here's the thing, why we're being called crazy? It's because we're entering a space that other people cannot see. We saw it. We saw the vision. We saw the instruction. We say yes. We enter to God's space. Everybody on the outside looking at it and go, you are crazy. You know, I think it's an honor to wear, wear the badge of being crazy for God. I'll take that. When we are in God's space, it does require a complete and immediate obedience. That's a tough one. You know, because with our own strength, we can't get much. Okay, it's not about us, it's about Jesus. He's inviting us in to flow into his current. And his current is bigger, way bigger than our current. Anything that we can see, anything that, that, that required a complete and immediate obedience. He wants us to see a, a vision within God's space boundary. Don't look at outside because the outside people looking at us think we are crazy. Positively crazy. Uh, Moses, when he has the Egyptian behind him and he has the Red Sea in front of him, he entered into God's space. God opened that thing. When David facing Goliath, he was in God's space. That's why it's the the giant is way bigger than he is, but he was entering into that because then at that moment, it's not by our strength, but the Holy Spirit started taking over. When Elijah, when Elijah with the 450 bale have a competition of fire, he was in God's space. That's why God moved, because he cannot bring his own fire. It is a space when we move, we breathe our existence based on the Holy Spirit. We enter the space and saying yes to God's invitation. You know, tell you the truth, it's like a dream seeing 5,600 people in this property. I could never imagine that last year because we are in God's space at that moment. Now, um, the main question is, are we willing to say yes to be a part of something that greater than ourselves? Are we going to respond in God's invitation to be in to God's space? I know for most of us, we're probably still recuperating. We're not done yet. We're still tired from last year. Uh, now the new thing's coming in, which is the, the Easter extravaganza. Uh, we are crazy, okay? Uh, you know, it's nice to not knowing that all your duck is in a row because to be honest with you, if somebody would tell me there will be 5,600 people show up in one day, uh, I would probably check it out. But the good thing is we don't know what a 5,600 people looks like. That's why we are so crazy and we just say yes to God. Just to be honest with you guys, you know, I don't know if, if we know how crowded is 5,600, we would probably running with our thing. We probably no, 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 God, that's, that's way too much. Now, let's look at it again back to the, to the story from a different point of view. Can you imagine at that moment, this boy bringing five loaves of bread and two fishes, uh, attending the seminar, uh, whole day seminar, but no brick and no food. So he bring his little lunch with him. When Philip look at him, Philip probably say, hey, uh, what do you got there? Uh, my lunch. Say, uh, can I have your lunch? Say, why? Of course, he's gonna say why, right? Uh, Jesus wants to feed this 5,000 men plus a woman and children with your lunch. Well, 
At that moment, he got a choice. He can say yes, or he can say no. Now, outside God's space, he's going to say, well, if I give you my lunch, what am I going to eat? Anyway, if I actually let you have my lunch to feed all this thing, it's not going to be enough. It doesn't make any sense to give this meager lunch to all these people. But at that moment, he decided, he decided to say yes. You know, I got a feeling that at that time he's going, I'm going to say yes and see what happened. Let me see what God can do with this little lunch. So he let it have it. And he decided to enter to an area and provide a need that bigger than the resource. He was entering into that space that's way bigger than what we can handle. Once again, we need to remember that God won't do it without us. Not that He cannot. Okay? Not that He cannot. But He gave us the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of something bigger than our, ourselves. To be absolutely, because absolutely without Him, we cannot do it. He can probably pick the donkey and the rock to worship Him. But without him, we can't do anything. You know what this boy have? He have a material for a miracle. What we bring is a material for a miracle. Moses didn't have much, but he does have material for a miracle. David didn't have much. Five rock against guy. I mean, you know, you need a real skill to sling that thing and have the rock hit the point. If you don't believe me, go try it. It is very difficult. Now, you know, when we have gone, we have all the scope and everything. He had nothing. And he just sling that thing because he knows that within cut space, your ability stops and replaces with God's ability. Immediately, everything becomes un unlimited possibilities. Okay. Our church, if you look at it, our church is not that big. But when God asks us, show my love, spread my gospel, show the good news to people, we're willing to do it. We are willing to be a bigger a part, to enter to a part that are bigger than ourselves. It does require the best of us. It does require sacrifice. Okay, don't get me wrong. It is saying yes, it's, it's, it's rather expensive. Now, actually, if we calculate it, it, it does cost everything for us. But let me tell you, entering into this God space, something bigger than ourselves and something that will outlast us, let me tell you the proof of outlasting us. This boy that bring the five loaves of bread and two fishes, he's dead. He, 2,000 years ago, he's dead. I mean, he got old and completely died. And guess what happened? We're still learning from him and talk about him now. That story lasted his lifetime. And we're still talking about it. And I do believe as long as this earth still here, we will still keep talking about him. That he is willing to enter into God's space. There is a lot more example in the Bible. But last year, last year in summer, I got a chance to actually go to Indonesia uh, for a wedding and I went to a place, somebody invited us for, to see a ministry uh, in Indonesia. And I didn't get a chance to share this thing to you guys because after that I come back from Indonesia, I have eyes problem and everything else. But I want to share to you uh, something, the opportunity that I, have, I was able to witness firsthand, seeing what type of things God can do when people are saying yes. It's an incredible thing when people say yes, what God can do through, through those people. Okay, Hilly and I went to Makassar. Uh, first time when we got there, we got there in the afternoon, somebody picked us up, 
and they showed us a ministry on uh, mental illness. Mental illness, what you think is not, you know, it's serious mental illness. Okay, people that turn violence because their mental illness, they probably got depressed for a while and then goes to the deep end. You know, you know what I'm saying. You know, because completely lost it, and uh, then and there is one lady over there. She got a degree in psychology, and uh, she could have worked somewhere else and make more money, but she decided to take care of these people on the street that have a mental illness to help them, to pray for them, and to rehabilitate people. Now, those people that have absolutely no chance in life, okay, if you are mental illness in a poor country, they don't even care about you. But there is one person that's saying yes to the calling of God and change the life of other people. It was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, we see a few other things in there. Uh, I saw uh, an, an orphanage. Uh, we were taken to an orphanage. I got a chance to talk to the director of the orphanage and you know, have some story with him, and he, he started telling the story. He himself has two kids. Somebody kind of like dropped him another kid to take care of, so he adopted that kid. And then after that, more and more end up to be about 58, 58 or almost 60 people. Let me tell you, those be, he, he is not rich, okay? He just barely made it. So, one room is for the, the, the boys' room. Bed are stacking up like this, going up and going on the side. And there is no aisle between the bed. So, if, you were, if your bed is at the corner, you would climb over other people's bed because there is no room. And the girls is the same thing. And this family in one room with the three kids. Okay. Let me tell you, he's saying yes to something that is way bigger than himself. Now, let me tell you, these kids now from the street that would have absolutely, again, no chance of future, they now have a chance for future because they send them to school, they teach them. And not only chance for future on this earth, but these kids now have a chance for future in the eternity because they have been introduced to Christ. And I want to show you a quick video, a 30 second, just a 30 second. When I get there, they were, they have carousel practically every night. So they get together and pray and uh, they sing. And since we were there, they, we invi they invited us. So let me show you the 30 second clip of the orphanage uh, surface. <laughs> For those of you who doesn't speak Indonesian, the, the word of what they're saying is God is so good. I'm really thankful for his goodness. I mean, it's amazing. Those kids, they don't go home at night. That is their home. They got no family and they're in the orphanage. When they start singing, I start crying. I mean, it was so touching having people with no parents. There, I don't know if there's, there's probably one or two siblings, but they have no one else in this world. There's somebody saying yes to take care of them so that they can have a future. And that was amazing. And, there is, uh, and then I was taken into a different area, which is a school for the blind. The director of the school of the blind is blind. That's given a new meaning of blind leading the blinds. Now, they explained to me what they're doing over there. They teach them how to use cell phone with a touch screen. I can understand if they use Blackberry with a keyboard. <laughs> now, 
How do you do touch screen on a phone while you are blind? I really, really want to see this. So uh, they actually install an app that everything appear on the screen is being read out loud in voice. But since their their eyesight is not there, but their other senses heighten usually, so that the phone was talking to them at about eight times the speed. I can't even catch anything. So they turn on the phone. The phone goes. Oh, and then and then they would okay okay tie. M, and then once they found one area of the keyboard that's saying on the on the touch screen, and they can type the rest of them, and then they go, <laughs> what in the world is that? So they're listening and they're responding. I mean, when you say yes, this is really going beyond the expectation, beyond the area of what God can do. I mean, what people can do, but so but. God can do it. And there is other thing. There is a ministry. They have a school of the ministry for people that want to serve Christ. In order to get there, you have to drive maybe two days and then ride on a motorcycle. Uh, it's a taxi motorcycle. It's beyond you guys' understanding. Uh, you go over off-road. Not because you enjoy off-road, but because there is no road. Okay, so let's, let's get the off-road here. Term kind of straight. Uh, it was a lot of amazing thing. And there is other ministry that... That, uh, 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 that I saw, but today we have the privilege to see the leader of that whole ministry that say yes to God and starting with all this ministry. I want to welcome Pastor Effort. He is from Makassar. He's the one who invited me to go over there, and I want to give him a chance to actually share a little bit. Let's give him a warm welcome. Anything you want to say, man. Well, I actually already prepared testimony. Uh, maybe uh, I'm just gonna share uh, the testimony right now. Um, well, so sorry about my English. I don't know why. Uh, when I come here, it seems like uh, I need to switch my my English mode to English mode, but still I can like <laughs> sometimes it's a bit uh, uh, hard. Anyway, so. Um, well, I also want to uh, share another testimony about the disciples that that we're having. I, there are two that I want to share. One of them, um, uh, she come from a remote village. Um, like Pastor Yonki said, it takes forever to get there. It's a lot faster to come to LA than to get to their place from my from my house. Um, basically. Uh, uh, she attended the mission school in Makassar and then after she attended the mission school she was placed in a village and later on she she stayed in my house with my wife and then we disciple her and then we sent her to learn how to reach out to the cousins if you know what I mean by cousins so uh, anyway so for the first two years of her ministry uh, she got nothing there was no fruit uh, she didn't uh, get anybody to come to know the Lord in Christ. When I'm talking about she got no fruits, well, I'm talking about that she will go to the street, share the gospel, she will go to another place, share the gospel, she will go to the market and share the gospel, and then this is her full-time job. And then basically uh, she got no fruits. But after two years in, the, in her ministry, uh, People start to listen to her and come to know the Lord. Anyway, uh, I want to share one of her minis uh, what uh, one of the things, uh, one of the testimony what the Lord has done through her. One day she visited one village where uh, uh, one of the uh, person that come to know Jesus through her ministry invited her to the ministry, and basic basically this this whole village is unbelievers. So she was with her partner. They were talking in one place, and then all of a sudden they they heard the people scream. And then uh, she came out with her partner from from that place, and then she saw like multi, a lot of people in in front of the house. And then so she tried to get into the house, and then after she got into the house, she find out that the the wife of the chief of the village. 
uh, got stroke, she was dying. So, and then uh, the whole family in the village in Indonesia, it's like when somebody got sick, got stroke like that, it's like it becomes like everybody, uh, you know, it becomes like everybody. I mean, like everybody wants to, to, to do something for that. So, and then all of a sudden she had the boldness to ask the family, can I pray for her? And then the, the husband, the chief of the village say, yes, you can pray for her. And then she said, but if I pray for her, I pray in Jesus' name. Is it okay? And then so the, the husband said, yes, it's okay. So before she pray for her, uh, before she pray for her, she then share about who Jesus is, how Jesus healed the people, how Jesus uh, pray for the dead and the dead resurrected got resurrected and then she also share about how Jesus heals the blind and then after her uh, short testimony and then she start praying with her partner when she prayed while she was praying all of a sudden the fear come to grasp her overwhelm her because when she was praying she start to think what if this woman will not wake up what if she's not healed? It seems like all of you are like, it's okay. <laughs> well, this is a big deal because this, this village is, uh, like what I said, is a cousin village. So, uh, what I mean, they come from uh, the major religion in Indonesia. So she was so, uh, you know, so she was so fearful. So she pray longer than, than usual because she expect that when she pray, the woman will wake up. But even though she already pray longer, the woman still don't wake up because she was stroke. I mean, stroke got stroke badly. So after she say amen, she look at the house and everybody eyes were looking at her. You know, there were like about 50 people were looking and staring at her and try to find out what happened. So she told me yes, that this is like my, the longest two, three minutes ever in my life. Because, you know, I already pray, but nothing happened. But after the three minutes, the woman got up. The woman asked for food. The woman literally walked. That's the first one. Because of there's somebody that wants to say yes to reach out to the lost. The second one, she also uh, finished from the mission school. She, was, she used to work in the restaurant. So re we reached out to her when she was, in the, uh, she was working in the restaurant. She never graduated elementary. Once again, I said she never graduated elementary. So basically, after she finished her uh, mission school, we sent her to one village. <clears throat> uh, in order for us to get to that village, it's like we have to go by bus 12 hours, and then we have to walk for another five hours. So yeah, so that's how far it is from Makassar. But uh, after a few months, then I got the report that the Lord is using her through healing gift. So she pray for people, people got healed. And then because of her ministry, three churches was planted around this area. So there are three city blessings in that area because of this, this woman who wants to say yes. So... The testimony that I want to give you is that one day that I visit one of the village, so I ask her to come along to, to join us for fellowship in that village. She has to walk about three hours to get to the village where I visited. Uh, and then uh, the other full-timers as well around that area. So we had fellowship around there. While we were there, a man come with a motorcycle. He was driving uh, the motorcycle for about six hours, he said. And then he was looking for, for this woman. And then he begged this woman, please come to my village. 
I got, uh, I got a niece that actually a few days ago she already come back from the hospital. The doctor already gave up and her situation is just getting worse. It's about time that to, for her to pass away. But I know I heard that you have the healing, uh, gift healing. So would you please come and pray for her? So the lady asked for my permission. Uh, the woman, uh, Pastor, can I go with him? And I said, well, our fellowship isn't finished yet. Why don't we gather and pray for the baby and then tomorrow you go to that village. So she gathered a few of the prayer, pray together for the baby. Basically the next day, the next morning I went back to Makassar and she went back to, uh, she went to uh, with that uh, guy to that village. And then the day after that, she called me. She, asked, she told me, Pastor, do you remember that you asked me to pray in that, you know, right, right over there? Yes. So she said, when I come and arrive in that village, her mother just embraced me. And her mother just told me, did you pray for my daughter? And then she said, why? Since yesterday, around this time, my daughter got up and she's now, she's now, I mean, she's getting better now. Before she never want to eat. Yesterday, around this time, she asked for food. She asked for drink. Now she's okay. And then so, so she asked, what time was that? And then she mentioned, the, the woman mentioned the time and then she, no, it was the time that, that when she pray with the other people. So I just want to encourage you. If the people, I mean, if the Lord can use these people, the Lord is also can use all of us. One, one more time I would say, the Lord can use all of us. So just please, just say yes and tell your neighbor, just say yes, okay? Thank you, Pastor Effort. When I, when I went there, I see the, the, all the ministry that they were doing, and I met the, the girl that he was talking about, and when they tell me the story, uh, I wrote it on my note, but I don't want to say it because it, it's, it's sensitive in Indonesia, and I know this thing is broadcasted. Uh, on the internet, which is can reach anywhere, so it's it's very sensitive, but it's amazing, you know. Over there, like he said, that girl is waiting over there while she was prayed for. Well, after she prayed, because if that w woman did not wake up, she's probably dead. That's all I'm going to say. It's serious, the consequence. Thank you very much. That's what happened when we willing to say god god i am going to say yes to you he will bring us into that space where our ability ended god's holy spirit continue that when the opportunity is way bigger than our ability to actually execute whatever needs to be done so it's amazing but it does require for us to say yes god i will do it you know if you Stand on the sideline and just wait. Nothing is going to happen. There are still many more examples in the Bible, but I thought listening to him directly is really something that we can see what happened when you say yes and what God can do through you and in you and for other people. So it's amazing. Uh, let me give you just one last example. One last example, someone in the Bible said yes to something that are extremely, extremely expensive and it's extremely very difficult proposition to say yes to. But because of that, we are all are here today. God say yes to send his only son, Jesus Christ for us. And Jesus say yes to go to the cross to bear all of our sin so that we do not have to be punished and have everlasting life i want to conclude this with um, 
Have you got the vision and invitation what God wants to do in your life? God's vision is, is scary. It does require sacrifice. It demands a lot from us. Sometimes we're too busy and too focused looking at our little lunch so that we worried, how am I going to have enough, let alone feeding the multitude? So we decided to stay out of God's space and just do it for ourselves. I want you to know that if we say yes and take whatever little lunch we have, we surrender it to Him. We catch His vision. God is going to take us to the area that we've never been before. And surrender Him, become unlimited possibilities, able to feed the multitude with just the little ones that we have. At the end of the day, it's all about Him. It's not about us. We know there are a lot more area that we can say yes to. Each of us are called different thing to say yes to a different thing. Most of us, I think majority of the people in this church say yes to the light on Miracle Hill. We were there. We see God's space. We see what God can do. And God is asking us again to go to the next one, which is coming another opportunity for us to witness. Another opportunity for us to bring the gospel majority that is going to attend on the Easter will be children. There is ability for us to show the children about God's love. I'm not asking for a volunteer. Volunteer is just people that works and walk away. I think God is looking for people that are willing to say yes and enter into God's space. Not just passing by, not just give us a little bit and walk away but really enter into the space. I'm asking for people that are willing to be a part of something that bigger than yourself, something that will outlast even our lifetime, the impact of what God can do when we say yes. I want us to see when we say yes and see God's miracle happen in our life and happen to other people so that they can see who God is. This is not only invitation to say yes, but we can respond to take the opportunity. It's not a volunteer time, it's not a working time, but it's time to take part of the opportunity that God gave us. You can say no, absolutely you can say no. I am not saying that Easter is the only place that you need to say yes, but that happens to be in front of us that required all of us to do it. Light on Miracle Hill is not just one or two people's project. It's all of us as a church, as a corporate, saying yes to what God has given us. This place that we have, it's not by coincidence that God put us here and it's not by co coincidence that God put us, give us a land, an area, a, a campus with a lot of empty land. It's not by coincidence that that hill is over there. God knows what we're willing, how crazy we are to jump in into God's space. So I just want to invite all of us, let's say yes to our little lunch. Surrender it to Him. See the vision and enter God's space and we will see His purpose to be filled in our life and to see how God will multiply what we have brought Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you, O oh God. Thank you for the opportunity, O oh God, for all of us to be here. For the opportunity, O oh God, for you to give us that we can enter and we can see who we are serving. 
We are not just serving a boss, but we are serving the King of King and the Lord of Lord that, that, that can perform miracle beyond that what we can do, O oh God. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that each one of us, as we face our day-to-day work, as you ask us, are we going to say yes? Are you going to say yes to witness to your co-worker? Are you going to say yes to be to, to give to somebody? It's, it might be something that you don't have, but will you say yes to that so that God can use you, so that God can move you into something an area of his space that goes beyond your ability, that goes beyond our, our opportunity, that goes beyond everything that we ever know or imagine. And God is going to bring us there. And as we faithful into the small thing, God is going to give us a bigger and bigger thing in our life. And when we look back, we say, God, you are my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As we walk out of here, oh God, I pray, oh Lord, that you would bless each one of us here. Bless them, oh God, that we will walk out of here with knowingly that we are worshiping the living God that can perform things that are greater than ourselves. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We surrender this beyond to you. Surrender our life unto you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.